In the gritty world of Fallout, the Enclave is a faction known for their advanced technology, sinister plots, and for being the remnants of the pre-war United States government. Yet despite the faction making its Fallout debut in 1998, there exists a wide assortment of various misunderstandings regarding the group. So today let's unravel the truth behind some of these common misconceptions. This is 5 more common misconceptions about the Enclave. Misconception number 1. The Enclave is the US government. What the heck? The Enclave being the continuation of the United States government is a misconception? How does that make sense? Repeatedly through the franchise, we're reminded that the Enclave is the remnants of the US government. So, what gives? Well, it's actually a common misconception that the Enclave is synonymous with the entire US government. Let me explain. In the Fallout series, the Enclave is often noted or referenced as the remnants of the pre-war United States government, but it's crucial to understand that they don't actually represent the entirety of the government that existed before the Great War. You see, governments, and specifically the United States government, are huge organizations with ties and involvement in just about everything that happens in their country. Roads, forests, healthcare, lawmaking, etc. are all tied to the American governing body. They're the group that ensures a country and its people are taken care of. Now, before the world was devastated by nuclear conflict, while the United States government attempted to work in the best interests of its people, there was a shadowy cabal of powerful individuals that aimed to ensure America, and more importantly themselves, would remain in power following the uncertainty of the future. This secretive group would be called the Enclave. As a secretive subsection of the United States government, including powerful CEOs and corporations, the Enclave would strategically position themselves to wind up on the winning side should the world fall into complete and utter disarray, say in the event of a nuclear holocaust. Notably, they set up hidden safe houses like the White Spring Bunker, Raven Rock, and the Poseidon Oil Rig, and commandeered various government-run projects like vault Project Safe House in order to achieve their goals. They didn't have the best interests of the people in mind, but rather their own. Going back to the misconception, it's essential to recognize that not every member of the US government became part of the Enclave. In fact, I could quickly name off two examples that are mentioned in the Fallout franchise. The founder of the Brotherhood of Steel, Roger Maxson, was an officer of the US Army, not a member of the Enclave. The man who almost outed the Enclave pre-war, Samuel Blackwell, was a US Senator, not a member of the Enclave. In addition, the Fallout universe features a diverse array of survivor groups, including those formed from the remnants of military, government, and civilian populations. Take the Charleston Emergency Government, for example. These were members of the US government that were not involved with the Enclave. Many government officials and citizens did not have the means interest, or opportunity to join the Enclave, and they ended up facing the harsh realities of the post-apocalyptic world independently or as part of other factions. So yes, while the Enclave is a specific faction that comes from the remnants of the pre-war US government and military, it doesn't represent the entirety of the government or the American population. Plenty of high-ranking government officials were members of the Enclave, but not all. While the Enclave sees themselves as the rightful rulers of America's ruins, not everyone agrees. Misconception number two, they were united strong. In the games that we face the Enclave, Fallout 2, Fallout 3, and what we learn from Fallout 76, we're typically confronted with a fierce and militaristic regime united in their goals. Yet, in each of these games, it's a different iteration of the same group. While the Enclave is often portrayed as a formidable and cohesive group, it's crucial to recognize that internal divisions and power struggles were inherent to their structure. At first glance, the Enclave may appear as a united front with a singular purpose, the restoration of their vision of America. 
However, a closer examination reveals fractures within the organization. Reality suggests that not all members of the Enclave share these same motivations or agree with the leadership's decisions. For example, in Appalachia, after not receiving communications from the oil rig or Raven Rock, Senator Thomas Eckhart assumed command of the Enclave forces in the region. However, Eckhart's ruthless desire for revenge against China for the Great War led to a revolt among the members of the White Spring Bunker. A civil war between Eckert and General Ellen Santiago led to the deaths of all members of the Appalachian Enclave, with the bunker's AI, Modus, being the sole survivor. After the destruction of the Enclave oil rig in 2242 at the hands of the Chosen One, once again the Enclave split. Some stayed at Camp Navarro only to be hunted and attacked by the NCR, while others fled eastwards, towards the nation's capital. Decades later, the Capital Wastelands Enclave met a similar end when President John Henry Eden and Augustus Autumn came into a disagreement about what to do with the region's water purifier, Project Purity. Eden's authority over Raven Rock's robots was pitted against Autumn's authority over the human members, leading to the eventual demise of both leaders. The Enclave's history is marked by instances where individuals or sub-factions within the organization pursued their own objectives, often at odds with the goals of other members or leaders. So whether they find themselves facing the relentless challenges of the wasteland, or dealing with dissent from their own ranks, the Enclave is far from an unassailable force. Their perceived unity is, in many cases, a facade maintained by a leadership that seeks to present a front of unwavering strength. Misconception number three, they're a big faction. One would think that being the self-proclaimed continuity of the US government, the Enclave would be a large force to be reckoned with. And while they are a powerful militaristic force thanks to their technology, the faction must be relatively small. Hear me out. In Appalachia, the Enclave is primarily made up of survivors of the Great War who sought shelter in the White Spring Bunker during the bombings. It is explicitly stated in a terminal entry at the bunker that Eckert had command of 48 people. And while Eckert's Enclave did resort to external recruiting methods, I doubt the Appalachian Enclave's true population exceeded 100 members. Surely the White Spring Bunker can't sustain much more than 100. And on the west coast, Dr. Curling notes that the Enclave oil rig housed approximately 1,000 inhabitants. And sure, while the western Enclave did have an offshore military base with Camp Navarro, it's noted in-game by Brotherhood of Steel agent Matthew that Navarro is a relatively new base and isn't fully staffed by the events of Fallout 2. So surely there can't be more than a few hundred housed there. And as for the Capital Wastelands Enclave, well, it's well known that Autumn's Enclave is composed of survivors of the Poseidon oil rig explosion, so their initial numbers had to have been a fraction of the Western Enclave's full force, so likely a couple hundred. And considering there is only a 35 year time difference between the end of Fallout 2 and the start of Fallout 3, Enclave's Autumn would really only have about one or so generations of new members born into the faction. And on top of all these estimates, the ideology of the Enclave doesn't really make for a great recruiting pitch. Unlike other factions in the Wasteland, the Enclave did not aim to integrate with or assimilate the diverse survivors populating the post-apocalyptic landscape. Sure, some folks like Anna Holt were permitted to join the Enclave, but outsiders were typically always seen as outsiders. Instead of recruiting people who share similar goals, the Enclave maintained its secluded existence. Their elitist approach to preserving pre-war America, coupled with their extreme views on mutation and purity, leaves the Enclave with a limited gene pool and recruitment pool. Their own beliefs contribute to their expected small population. The notion of a vast Enclave force that rivals other expansive wasteland factions is a common misconception. Misconception number four, everyone in the Enclave was evil. I would say that I'm a pretty big Enclave detractor. They're a despicable dictatorship bent on eliminating not only mutants, 
but ordinary wastelanders who are just trying to survive. There's a reason they're the big bad villains in two of the Fallout games. However, with that being said, I must give some Enclave members some credit. Members of the Enclave are typically characterized by their loyalty to the organization and a shared desire to restore what they perceive as the pre-war American way of life. However, this doesn't mean that every Enclave member is inherently evil. I've got a few examples. Sergeant Granite, encountered in Fallout 2, is a great example of a nuanced Enclave member. Granite commands the Enclave Control Company, a special unit tasked with perimeter defense of the Enclave oil rig. After rigging the oil rig to explode, the Chosen One will happen upon Granite's squad. Granite informs the Chosen One that Special Agent Frank Horrigan is waiting for them and is adamant about not letting the Chosen One off the soon-to-explode rig. With a successful speech check, Granite and his team can be convinced to help in a fight against Horrigan, turning against the Enclave. Now, does this change of heart in the face of death make Granite and his team the good guys? No, but it's certainly a good first step. It's noted in Fallout Bible 6 that Granite and his team went on to adventure the wastes. So, there's that. Another example of a detractor of the Enclave comes from one of the remnants in New Vegas. Cannibal Johnson served in Captain Judah Krieger's squad at Navarro. Johnson was a well-known miscreant among the Enclave ranks. He would constantly question orders, subvert mission objectives, and do his best to serve without serving. According to Arcade Ganon, if anyone didn't belong in the Enclave, Cannibal Johnson was it. And lastly, Dr. Whitley is a character that never actually appears in any Fallout game. It's discovered during Fallout New Vegas that Whitley was the scientist responsible for the creation of the DuraFrame iBot project at Raven Rock. Whitley demonstrated quite a bit of empathy during his research and prototyping, caring for each iBot as if they were his own children. And while Whitley's manpower was eventually redirected towards working on Hellfire Power Armor, it was not before Whitley sent his iBot research westwards towards Navarro. I think each of these characters shows that not every member of the Enclave is outright evil. Sure, again, none of them are outwardly altruistic and good, but what can you really expect when your superiors issue less than admirable orders? Each example has demonstrated doubts or concerns regarding the Enclave's ways, challenging the common misconception that every member of the Enclave is outright evil. Misconception number 5. Everyone knew John Henry Eden was a computer. Following the destruction of the Enclave oil rig at the hands of the Chosen One, Augustus Autumn's father received a message from one President John Henry Eden ordering the senior scientist to move the surviving Enclave troops to the Ravenrock bunker in the capital wasteland. Autumn Sr. soon found out that John Henry Eden was actually a computer personality. Now, a common misconception is the assumption that everyone in the Enclave knew that President John Henry Eden was in fact an advanced Zax AI computer. In reality, the knowledge of Eden's true nature was not widespread among Enclave members. In fact, during Eden's tenure as president, only three people knew the truth about him. Autumn Sr., Augustus Autumn, and the Lone Wanderer. And if you put yourself in the shoes of Enclave leadership, it makes sense as to why this information should be kept a secret. Prior to the Enclave's defeat at the end of Fallout 2, the Enclave thus far had human leadership who had ties back to the President of the United States. It's mentioned in Fallout 76 that the last president of the United States was aboard the Enclave oil rig at the time of the Great War, taking leadership of the Enclave. It's mentioned in the Fallout Bible that Dick Richardson's father was president of the Enclave, and then Dick Richardson was the last known human president of the Enclave. But with Eden, the Zach's AI just sort of assumes himself to be president. There is no tie back to the United States or any other former president. He just hears word of the Enclave's defeat, and takes ownership of it. And for a faction that's doing their darndest to be seen as the continuation of the United States government, relying on a computer, even if it's an advanced supercomputer, does quite a bit to hurt one's credibility. 
I'd find it hard to imagine that the American populace would vote for a computer to be their leader. This fact, as well as their deferring ideologies, is part of the reason why leadership at Raven Rock was at odds with each other. Augustus Autumn knew that if word that the Enclave president is a stationary computer spread, it would hurt the legitimacy of their movement. And so, part of Autumn's plan was to usurp the presidency from under Eden, bringing the Raven Rock Enclave into a new era. However, both the plans of Autumn and Eden would be stopped by the Lone Wanderer and Lion's Brotherhood of Steel. The secret of Eden's true identity would die alongside Raven Rock and the Enclave. And that wraps up 5 common misconceptions about the Enclave. While the Enclave are a beloved villainous faction, there exists a wee bit of misinformation surrounding the group. From their true size to their true leadership, hopefully we've dispelled some of these prevailing myths. If you can think of any more Enclave misconceptions or any other Fallout misconceptions, let me know. But that's all from me today, folks. If you liked the video, be sure to like and subscribe. I have a Discord server, join it if you'd like. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. I miss those days sometimes. We all had a purpose, you know? I admit some of the folks in charge were pretty ruthless. The rest of us, though, we were just trying to civilize things. The NCR was still new and it didn't look like they'd last all that long. Then we lost the oil rig and shortly after that the base at Novaro. Nobody left except us remnants. 